All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Lynn Pernell Christensen. I own my own photography business called Lynn Pernell Photography, LLC. I specialize mostly in weddings, but I also shoot events, engagements, and portraits. I first got interested in photography in high school. I went to an honors vocational high school in Monmouth County called Communications High School. It was a theme-based school, so I got to take a bunch of photo classes, and that's where I learned I really liked photography and pursued it ever since. When I came to Montclair, I knew that I wanted to major in photography, but I also decided to minor in business, which ended up being a really helpful decision. I've learned now that when you own your own photography business, you spend probably less than 20% of your time actually taking pictures, and the rest of the 80% is paperwork, business formalities, client relationships, marketing, taxes, contracts, and all of that. So it's good to have at least a basic background and knowledge of business, which my business minor really helped me with. In 2013, I was in my junior year of college. I was taking this exact class, commercial photography. All of the assignments we had and our studio visits and lectures just like these really solidified in my mind that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to have my own commercial photography business. So that April, before the class was even over, I decided to incorporate my business and I formed an LLC. So later on, I'll explain exactly what that is and how you do it. I now specialize mostly in wedding photography. When I first started out, I was actually most interested in fashion photography, but after I shot my first wedding in 2011, I really enjoyed it and continued getting mainly wedding bookings, so that's what I decided to focus on. What I love about wedding photography is that it combines many different aspects of photography that I love. There's the fashion and portrait aspect when you're photographing the bride and groom, there's a big still life component when you're photographing all the details, and there's a huge photojournalistic aspect when you're capturing the ceremony and all those candid, raw, emotional moments. So I'm gonna go through some of my work and talk about how I shoot throughout a typical wedding day. So my day usually starts with the getting ready portion of the day. I usually cover the bride while my second shooter is at the groom's location. This usually involves the bride getting her hair and makeup done, getting dressed, maybe putting jewelry on. In addition to capturing the bride getting ready, it's also really important to photograph any details that are there. So that includes boutonnieres, bouquet, shoes, rings, all that stuff. I like to get this done first thing before she's put on any of these things. So usually I'll get in, I'll get my settings right, and then the first thing I do is capture all the details. Sometimes rather than just taking a shot of the rings alone, I'll put it on a more interesting background, maybe something else she has in the room. This one I put in one of the roses in her bouquet. So I also like to get really close up macro shots of the rings, especially if there's any details on them like engravings. So the same thing goes for over at the groom's location. You have to make sure to get any of his cufflinks, socks, shoes, any other details that are there. Before we head over to the ceremony location, I like to get a portrait of both the bride and the groom separately. I like to do this before we leave while their hair and their clothes and their makeup are all nicely put together. If time allows, I also like to get shots of the groomsmen and the bridesmaids separately. I like to get a mix of the formal post shots and then mixed in with some candids or shots of them walking or interacting or something a little less stiff. So the most high pressure part of the day is definitely the ceremony. Because you can't instruct or pose the couple, you can't repeat anything, you have to be on your toes, ready at all times. So I always make sure to test my settings before the ceremony starts so I'm ready to go. I like to shoot with a mix of long and wide shots. So I'll coordinate with my second shooter before the ceremony. We usually each have two cameras with two different lenses on them. So if she's getting more of the wide shots, I'll be sure to focus on close-ups or vice versa. Reaction shots are also really important to get, especially the groom's reaction when the bride is walking down the aisle. Even better if there's crying involved. I also like to look around in the seats to get reaction shots from friends and family. After the ceremony is usually when I like to take the portraits of the couple together and the bridal party all together and also the family portraits. Usually we'll go take photos at different spots at the ceremony location or reception location. If time allows, we'll also go to a nearby park or the beach or any other locations they might like. After we're done with all the portraits is the cocktail hour, which is mostly just candid shots, some post shots of the guests, and of course detail shots and shots of the food. When capturing the details, definitely focus on any handmade details. An important rule is if they spent time or money on it, capture it. 
and the more time or money they spent on it, the more important it is to capture it. Before cocktail hour ends, I like to go into the reception location and get all my detail shots before they let any guests in while everything is still untouched. When the reception starts, it usually begins with the first dance, sometimes father-daughter and mother and son dances. And that's usually followed by toasts and speeches. Again, shots of people crying is always an A+. After that, the rest of the night is a lot more low pressure. There aren't too many time sensitive shots that you can miss, so it's mostly just a matter of getting good candid shots and more detail shots. Of course, you should still always be in the lookout for any cute moments that happen. Uh, flower girls, ring bears are usually up to something cute. And then the last big event in the night is usually the cake cutting. And then sometimes there's a bouquet toss or garter toss. Sometimes there's a big send-off they need to get pictures of. This couple had a fireworks show at the end of the night. And then nowadays, it's become pretty popular to get a big group shot of all the guests at the end of the night. So that's pretty much an average rundown of how I shoot a wedding. So because weddings typically happen in the summer or usually anywhere from March and April to October, November, I recommend shooting events, portraits, and other types of jobs the rest of the year. As you can see, my peak is usually around like the summer months and then it kind of dwindles throughout the winter months. So it's a really good way to fill up your slow months, supplement your income, um, especially things like headshots. People need that all year round. Um, as you can see, there's a little spike of portraits between November and December. A lot of people like to get portraits for Christmas presents or Christmas cards or things like that. So when I'm not shooting weddings, I'm shooting a lot of bar mitzvahs. Sweet 16s. I do a lot of communions. Baptisms. Birthday parties. So I'm located in Jersey City, so I also book a lot of New York City events. Some of them are corporate events or award shows. I've done some fundraisers. I've also gotten to shoot a few events with celebrities like Ruben Studdard, the American Idol winner. I also shot an event with Eliza Deshku. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Um, she was in Bring It On and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then I also got to shoot model Christy Turlington and actress Meryl Streep, who I think we all know. Like I said, headshots are also really good to capture. They're popular all year round, so that's nice. Do a lot of professional portraiture. And of course, some baby portraits and family photos. All right, so whenever you decide you're ready to start your business, these are the steps you would take to create an LLC. So an LLC is a limited liability corporation. Basically what that means is it's a business, usually with one owner, that's a separate entity from you as a person. So that's good in case you get sued or something like that. They can't go after you personally. They can only go after your business assets. So the first step I would take a lot of time working on is picking a business name. So if your name is unique or catchy, it might be a good idea to use your name in it. My personal recommendation, if you have a very common name like Mike Smith or something like that, I wouldn't use that. So if someone were to go uh, look for you on social media or Google or something, they would come up with tons of them. So I chose to use my first and middle name in my business name, so Lynn Pernil. My first name is Chinese origin because I was born in Hong Kong. My parents gave me a Chinese name. And my middle name is Pernil, which I grew up in Denmark, so they wanted to give me a Danish middle name. So that combination of a Chinese first name with a Danish middle name is very rare. I don't think I know anybody out there with the name Lynn Pernil. So again, like I said, being unique is really good. But if, if you don't want to use your name or you have a really common name, you can always just pick a name for your business. This is also good if down the line you see it becoming more of a uh, company rather than a uh, single owner type business. But I like to keep mine personal, so I use my personal name for it. All right, so once you've decided what you want your business name to be, you can go on to form your business. So you would go to the um, New Jersey State website. You can even just Google how to form an LLC, New Jersey, something along those lines. I believe there's a $125 filing fee to start. And then each year after that, there's a smaller fee when you um, file your annual report. But to start, I believe it's just $125. So you'd pick which type of business you wanna form. I prefer LLC, that's what I think works for most photography businesses. But um, definitely you're welcome to Google which one you think would work best for you. If there's two people involved, it would probably be a limited liability partnership. Um, obviously it wouldn't be a nonprofit because you're ma making money. But if you're not sure which one to use, definitely Google all the different types. Okay, so once you have 
that part done, I believe it takes you over to the IRS website. So once you're done on the state level, filing your business and everything, you need to get an FEIN. So what that is, I believe it stands for Federal Employer Identification Number. Sometimes they call it an EIN, sometimes a TIN, a tax identification number. But basically what it is, is you as a person have a social security number, you as a business have an FEIN or EIN or TIN. It's just a number assigned to your business that's used for filing taxes and all things like that. So I don't know if it's a couple days or maybe a week or so later, you'll get your business certificate in the mail. Once you have all that, you basically have a business. You can go to a bank, you can start a business bank account, you can get a debit card, credit card, checks, anything you need to run your business, and you can also file your taxes. All right, so what you can do now, if you're not quite ready to start your own business, but you still wanna to work towards it, the best thing I could recommend during college is internships. So I had two internships with Allure Magazine and Harper's Bazaar Magazine. I also assisted a fine art photographer, I assisted a commercial photographer, and that really allowed me to see what the photo industry was like, how to run your own business, um, how fine art photography works, how commercial photography works, the business end of things, how you work with clients, all that stuff. So the best way to learn is to shadow someone you admire, or someone who's doing what you wanna do one day. So the next thing I would do is start building up your equipment. So like I said, I would, I've been interested in photography since I was 14 years old. So for every birthday or Christmas or holiday, I would wish for photography equipment. So when I graduated, it wasn't like, oh my God, I need to buy every single piece of equipment I need to run my business. So the last thing that I really, really highly recommend doing is even if you're a photo major or whatever major you are now, even if you're not a photo minor officially, you can still most likely take at least intro level classes. If there's a class you wanna take that's only for majors, sometimes you can just write up and they'll let you take it. So some classes I would really recommend taking are the entrepreneurship classes. My last year here, they actually invented that whole entrepreneurship program, but that class was really amazing. It was also really good for blending fine art and business. So I remember um, our assignments actually had a lot to do with creativity, thinking outside of the box, being innovative. So you guys, I think, would really appreciate that class. Another class that was really helpful was intro to marketing. Obviously, it's really important to market your business, so that's a really good thing to know, even just at an intro level. Business decision making was also a really helpful class, taught me how to use statistics to decide what to do in a business. And then services marketing was a class that I think was also for majors, but it was really rel relevant to me, so I wanted to take that class just as a regular elective. So that class taught me how to market for a service business. So that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, you're definitely more than welcome to ask. This is my website, and these are uh, my usernames for all of my social media. Like I said, everything's Lynn Pernil, easy to find. So thank you so much for having me. Good luck to all of you.